Okay. So uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we had a little bit of a break right now, and uh, I don't know exactly what's going to happen come down the road with the spring break in April. So we'll see how that goes. Anyway, we need to continue our uh, class, and I'm glad that uh, we're doing it at least online. And uh, I need to know basically from all of you, I know some of you have been following on uh, the videos that I've been posting, but for some reason I only saw, I think a, a little less than half the class who actually watched this video, at least according to the numbers from uh, YouTube. I really want to have everybody as much as possible basically doing this online thing. Uh, otherwise, we're going to fall behind, and it's not good. I mean, we really want to uh, to continue our class. Of course, in uh, keeping up with all of the uh, what is required from us to, in terms of uh, staying healthy and uh, washing and doing all of the things that we're required to do. Uh, at least in here, I really want to make sure that because this is a, uh, although it's, we're doing it online, the participation is still required. I know you guys uh, are, uh, are uh, we used to, I used to ask you guys in class and I really want to continue that, uh, that working habit. And you're going to be graded also on participation, so I'll tell you exactly when that happens and I will uh, require that you guys post uh, work. Okay. Let me share with you my uh, screen right now so that we can start this. And we're going to start with the uh, first. I need to show you the uh, canvas. Where is canvas? Actually, it's in here. Let me go back into this screen. Okay. Let me go to our class in here. Uh, this is uh, something I want you guys to be aware of that I've been doing, and I know uh, some of you do and some of you probably don't. Uh, uh, when you come to, uh, to Canvas, uh, there is a section in here called Discussion. I want you guys to be visiting this section as much as possible and following up what's going on in class. Uh, all right, now I have uh, such a chapter five in here and I'm going to post the, the link of this video and everything that goes with this class into here. Namely, right now I posted the PowerPoint I modified the PowerPoint and you will have an updated version of the PowerPoint on this link. And I would want you guys to come in here under the reply button and start asking questions. This will benefit everybody and uh, including the, uh, the, um, the people who do not, uh, who are not here. And if you ask a question in the, in the, in the bottom where it says uh, the inbox, that's going to be between you and I. And I really want the discussion to benefit everybody by asking the question in here because uh, it's going to be relevant for uh, to everybody. That's one thing. Also, you will be uh, graded on participation. And at some point, we're going to pause and ask you to actually uh, do the, uh, the things I'm going to ask you to do. And I'm going to take about two, three, four minutes and check how everybody is doing. And once you guys are done, then uh, I'm, we're going to work the problem together. I'm going to go actually and do uh, like what we used to do in the classroom. And once we're all said and done, I'm going to come into assignments in here. And I'm going to create a new assignment for you guys. And that assignment will be uh, where you're going to be posting your, uh, your work. Again, you're graded for participating. You're not graded for right or wrong. All where I'm asking for you guys to do is actually, once we pause for the calculation, you can, you can actually do it on your own. Now, if you choose to work with somebody else, that's fine. You can get in touch with them. How did you do? What did I do? This is what I think. This is what I think. And we want to keep it as much as possible a, a, a similar to what we were doing in Classroom. I really want the Classroom to be interactive. I don't want it to be one way. I don't like to be uh, the one who's giving everything because that way you're not going to learn much, much honestly. You will learn by doing, and you will learn actually by working together. So that's really how my philosophy is as far as learning. And I think it's an effective and documented uh, uh, method of uh, learning that is more effective than just lecturing. Do you guys understand? At least I need to have some sort of a feedback from you guys. What do you guys think?
Ian? Yeah. Good? Does this sound good? It sounds good to me. Very good. How about Alexis? Yeah, sounds good to me. Very good. So we want to keep up with this, this, this uh, thing. I also, we have a project that is ongoing uh, into the assignment, I mean the assignment actually, I'm sorry. Uh, the project was, uh, is due on April uh, 9th. And uh, right now uh, it says on paper, I'm gonna change this one to online because right now, do you guys all have access to uh, to uh, some sort of a scanning device, either a phone with a camera uh, capability or an actual scanner? I don't. Yeah, I do. Okay, I want everybody, if, if someone has an issue with that, uh, please uh, 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 communicate with me directly so that we can find the solution. I changed right now the submission of that project from being a, a, a paper of, uh, submission to an online submission so that if you can scan the document with a scanner or with a, with a phone or something like that, you can always come in here to where it says, I'm gonna change this assignment right now to a file upload, okay? So right now it's, uh, it's going to allow you to, uh, to upload your project in here and once it's uploaded, they can come and grade it later on. Uh, I will check with the department to see if they're going to open at all. And if they do uh, uh, like give us some sort of a place where we're going to go and you guys can drop your, uh, your assignments if in case you cannot do it online so that they can go and pick it up and grade it for you. Because we want to, regular, uh, to, to keep the course a little bit rig rigorous and you're uh, going to be graded and actually doing things, not just because of participating or anything like that. Does this sound like a good plan to everybody? Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, so today's lecture, we're starting chapter five. And chapter five, let me start to see. Do you guys see my screen or not? I want everybody, if there is anybody who has an issue, see it now before we continue and then realize at the end it's not working. Okay, so nobody's uh, objecting, so we're gonna continue right now. So chapter five the, uh, deals with the concepts of radiation and spectral analysis, spectra in general, spectrum and the uh, plural is spectra. Basically, the question is the following. How do we know what we know about the universe? How do we know that such and such a star, for example, has that much hydrogen? Or even the sun, for example, does it have this much hydrogen or this much composition? Composition. Okay. Uh, the only thing that we can go by right now is actually by observing them, looking at them. Nobody, not a single uh, device was sent and uh, to analyze, for example, the structure of the sun, because uh, you cannot get near it. By the time you get near the sun, nothing will, uh, will, uh, will stay in its state and actually will, will break apart because of the high temperature. This is one problem, at least as far as the sun is concerned. But the stars are very, very far away. There is no human so who ever went to any star not including even, uh, not even our sun, let alone any other star that is very far away from us. The device that we sent so far, if you want to, you can turn off your, your phone right now or, or uh, sound because it's coming back in here and there is a reverberation. But if you're gonna ask questions, please just uh, turn it on, okay? We, we don't want this, like I said, to be like a dry discussion I and mean, in one way. Anyway, uh, there is no way that we have, there is, we have never sent any device or any, 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 any man-made device outside of our solar system. Right now we have Voyager, which is at about 150, on March the 10th, it was about 150 astronomical units from the Earth. And that is not far at all. That is still well within the solar system actually. <laughs> And it did not leave yet the solar system. Planet nine, which is hypo uh, I mean, it's a hypothetical planet, is about 700 astronomical units. So this device, the uh, Voyager, did not even reach halfway there to planet nine. So we're uh, not a single thing has left our solar system to go, for example, to even the nearest 
star, which is 4.2 light years away, and tell us what the structure of that star is. So we need a way of learning about the universe, and the only way we learn about the universe is through light, basically. Electromagnetic radiation. That is basically the only way we can learn about the universe. So this is a picture of our sun actually here, taken with different uh, frequencies. And it gives you different uh, visualization of the sun. And actually it gives us far more than that. It gives us even the structure of the sun. And we'll see exactly how that is. We'll know exactly what, is, what the sun is made up of, okay? If you guys watch any kind of those uh, TV shows that have uh, like, uh, they have criminal investigations and things like that. They can tell you exactly what the person had had, for example, if uh, the person was poisoned, what kind of materials went into his system, tell the composition of the stuff that went in there, just by doing the spectral analysis. This is, in a sense, what this is. This is like forensic science. From the light we reach, uh, that reaches us from the sun, we can tell, basically, what the... What the uh, what the sun is made up of. Of course, the main uh, component, and we will learn that toward the end, is hydrogen followed by helium and traces of other elements. Maxwell, in the 1800s, came up with uh, something that helped us basically toward this route. Uh, do you guys remember what we did when we were learning about Newton's laws of motion? Do you guys remember Newton's laws of motion? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, pretty good. <laughs> so there were three laws in there. The first law basically states that uh, uh, if an object is not under a net forces, that object will stay in its place if it was not moving. And if it was moving, it's going to continue moving at constant speed in the same direction. So that's law number one. Law number two said, okay, if an object is under a net, uh, net forces, that object's motion will change in such a way that the change in motion, namely the acceleration, is proportional to the force, and that proportionality is actually inversely proportional also to the mass. The more mass of the object, the less change in motion is going to experience. So that was the second law of motion. The third law of motion stated that uh, uh, if two objects interact, so the first two laws that with the single object, the third one explains when we have more than an object, and that is if two or more objects interact, they do so in such a way that if one object uh, exerts a force on the second, the other one exerts a force that is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. The promise then there was that if you know all of these three laws, you can solve any problems in mechanics. Any problem, that's it. In, in, in physics. And people were busy with that. They were doing all kinds of problems uh, with these three laws, and it kept a lot of people busy. However, there was some phenomenon that we couldn't explain them with this laws. One of them is light. And uh, electricity and magnetism, in a sense, had, uh, I mean, at least the forces that are related to this, uh, to this two phenomena, namely electricity and magnetism, needed some studies. And people were involved. A lot of people. I'm sorry. Sorry. Did you say something? Okay. Yeah. You have a question? No. No. Okay. Good. So basically. Uh, uh, so the laws of electricity and magnetism involve a lot of people, and uh, at the end, in the uh, toward the uh, before he actually died, a uh, few years before he died, Maxwell, that is, he came up with a theory where he combined all of the laws of electricity of electricity and magnetism in a few equations. Okay, they're a little bit complicated and beyond the scope of this course, but the point being is the following that uh, 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 light as we know it is, uh, is, uh, is made up or at least is, uh, an, uh, is uh, how should I put it, is expressed in terms of the interaction of two fields, the electric field and the magnetic field, the field, okay? 
Uh, remember when we were doing uh, gravity, we talked about gravity, there is something called the gravitational uh, 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 field because the sun at some point exerts that or at least modifies the environment around it in such a way if we put a planet next to it, that planet will be subject to the effects of the sun indirectly through that field, through the gravitational. The same thing in here in this concept. If I have a charge, an electrical charge sitting somewhere, let me see if I can if I can uh, draw this one with a little bit of visual in here. Okay, let me go down a little bit in here. And this is in the way. Okay, so if I have a charge in here in space, this is charge Q. It's going to alter its surrounding and change its surrounding in such a way. If I bring another charge in here, that charge will be either attracted or repelled from toward the charge. This is unlike gravitational field when we talk about the gravity, which is all attraction, this one can be repulsive. In other words, a positive charge and a positive charge would repel, a negative charge and a negative charge would repel, and a positive and a negative charge will attract. So that's basically the laws of electricity. So what we say in here is that this charge creates a field in here, an electric field to be more specific. So there is an electric field at some point, and that electric field is one component to Maxwell's equation. Also, if I bring a bar magnet in here, you're familiar with the bar magnet, I hope you guys know. It's a magnet, a regular magnet that you guys, I mean, it's a toy, we all play, played with it. And if I, play, if I bring in here a compass, the compass will point somewhere. This is normally the compass will point toward the North Pole. However, if I bring it next to a magnet, it's going to point somewhere. If I move the compass around, it's going to point to a different direction. So what I say in here is that the bar magnet creates a magnetic field that goes around it. So that is what a bar magnet is. When Maxwell studied this, uh, this, this phenomenon, and people studied it actually before him too, they found that the origin of the magnet, uh, uh, magnetism in general, is current. So this is how the Earth would look like. This is what the Earth is. This is what we know as the North Pole. This is the geometrical North Pole. Okay. This is what we, not the, uh, the geographic North Pole. This is where Alaska and everybody else lives. And this is where the South Pole is. This is where Antarctica is. If I bring a compass next on Earth, anywhere on Earth is going to point toward the north, okay? If I continue following the compass, it's always going to point the world toward the north, no matter what. So the Earth is a big magnet, just like the bar magnet. The Earth is a big magnet, and everywhere I look, there is a magnetism going around in here. So what's going on in here, actually, is that the Earth is made up of material that is mainly metal inside, and that metal is at extreme high temperature, and that temperature uh, uh, will make that the metal, because of the rotation of the Earth, remember the Earth is going from west to east, and that's why we see things going from uh, east to west in the sky. As the Earth is spinning around its axis, it's basically making that, uh, that the inside spin, and that creates a current, and the cre current creates a magnetic field. So here is a magnetic field, Combined with electric fields, what Mr. Maxwell has said is that this two produce electromagnetic uh, radiation. You see where the word electro and magnetism, electromagnetism, that is where the roots of this word is. So let me go back and continue the year. Life turned out to be just a, uh, just a, uh, uh, a special kind of electromagnetism, okay? Not a special kind, it's in a sense, all light is, is just a small portion of the entire spectrum that includes all electromagnetic waves. And we're gonna talk about the spectrum shortly. So Mr. Maxwell's equations actually yielded waves. And the waves are just similar to what you guys see when you go outside on a pond. You see the ripples on the surface of the water in here produced by this, uh, uh, what is that, a frog? Those are what waves. This is a surface, these are surface waves. 
Cases are characterized by special uh, characteristics. First of all, the frog, or at least the water next to the frog, never reaches the edges of the, of the palm, as the palm is calm. The only thing that travels in this case is actually the energy associated with the wave. The ripples, if you wish, on the surface are the ones that travel, not the wave, not the medium itself. So, here is what we, uh, what we, what we mean by wave. A wave turbulence in a medium, uh, think of it as the surface of the water, for example, or think of it as a, as a rope, rope extended from one end to the other end, held in one point. From the other end, you're exciting it, you're giving it an up and down motion, okay? This up and down motion, you're not moving the other end or any, or any other end of the, or any other part of the, uh, the, the rope. All you're doing is actually moving the edge of the rope up and down this edge in here, okay, going up and down. So what you notice in here is that the disturbance that you create in one point travels. So it's not the rope is moving left to right, it's actually the disturbance that is moving, not the, uh, not the rope. So any given point in time, if I wait long enough, portions of the rope start to exhibit the same motion as the other end of the rope does. So that's what we call a wave. And that is exactly what's happening with the electromagnetic waves. The star, for example, Alpha Centauri or Proxima Centauri, which is a nearby star, produces light. That light is by the motion of the electrons. Remember, an electron is a charge or a, a, a proton. Most of the time, it's electrons, actually. As the electron by itself is going to produce an electric field because it's a charge. And uh, because it's moving, it's going to also in. Then that disturbance in space is going to continue traveling until 4.2 light years later, it reaches our eye. Uh, this is probably not correct because Proxima Centauri is not visible to the naked eye because it's a, it's a, uh, uh, what is it? It's a uh, dwarf uh, star, actually. It's not a big star. It's, uh, it's not that big, but the one next to it does. Uh, 40A does because it's a little bit bigger than the sun. So if we see it with telescope, we can collect the light from it. But with the light, we can connect even the one from Proxima Centauri because it comes with different frequencies and we're going to talk about the frequencies. I can't the see if you're sharing. Sorry? Screen. You can see? No. All the uh, the screen share is just stuck on the retro uh, retrograde motion of the Mars project. Yeah, you me too. yeah, I see yeah, all the, like, the tabs and stuff you got up top, but it's not like. Oh, you just should have told me that. Okay, I thought that. Uh, I thought it was something on my end. That, that's why I left. <laughs> okay, okay. So, me too. I thought it was frozen. Okay, let me stop. Probably. Okay, let me share again. And I'm sorry, you should have told me that. Okay. Okay, so this is what I am at right now. Um, yes, you yeah, been here? Now, the slide shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I should, have, I should have said, wait a minute, this is not correct. Okay, so the previous slide, basically, this is a disturbance on the surface of the water I was talking about, and this is Maxwell himself. And like I said, this recording is going to be available on, online. So you will see exactly what I saw, hopefully, okay? Okay, so this is basically where I am at right now. Okay. okay. So uh, that's a good point that you guys raised because we're trying to change things in here, okay? Anyway, the point being in here, change things in here, this is the approach that we used to have in happen live, so there is a problem you guys would have raised it. Anyway, uh, so the wavelength, in here, so basically some of the characteristics of the wave, this is what I was talking about earlier when I said that the disturbance is created from one end. Think of this end where this line is in here going up and down. That is where the electron in the star is moving up and down, creating this disturbance. And think of the other end is our eyes waiting in here for the disturbance to travel to us. We call the wavelength the distance between crest to crest. So trough to trough. The trough is the lowest point in the disturbance, in the wave, and the crest is the highest point. Okay? 
So this distance, it doesn't matter where you take it actually, is still the wavelength. The wavelength from here, it uses the symbol lambda. That is the Greek letter for, uh, for, uh, that we use for the, uh, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the wavelength. Similarly, a wave can be described as a uh, time disturbance. Okay, here is how it, it is as a time disturbance. Before I do the, uh, the next, uh, the previous slide, I really want to show you this. This, let me go back. This is a picture of the wave. If you go outside, for example, to the ocean and see surface waves, and you take a picture for the, with, uh, with your camera, the wave will exhibit this behavior. You take the camera and measure the distance from crest to crest, uh, and uh, scale the picture, because the picture usually is a lot smaller than the actual, uh, actual, uh, uh, actual object. You can scale it up, and you can find the wavelength. Okay, so that is a picture. You freeze time. That's what you do with a camera. You take a picture. That's basically how it is. So let me go back to the, into a, a temporal behavior. How the wave behaves in time is similar also to uh, to the spatial behavior. It's still a wave, but this is on a given point in space. So a point in space, for example, is undisturbed until a wave, an electromagnetic wave, hits it. And when it does. The electric field will oscillate, magnetic field will oscillate in such a way that oscillations are given by this behavior. The maximum displacement, the strength of the electric field or the strength of the magnetic field represents the intensity or the amplitude in here. Not the intensity, I'm sorry, the amplitude. The intensity proportional to the amplitude squared to be more specific. And the period is again, from peak to peak, or from low to low. They're all the same distance. Whether I'm measuring it from low to low, or high to high, or any similar point, they're the same time. That's called the period. The relationship between the wavelength lambda and the inverse of the period, which is called the frequency f, is what we call a dispersion law. This law, you will need to do some calculations. Okay? C is the speed of light, it's 300,000 kilometers per second. So you take note of it, three times 10 to the power eight meter per second. This clock, I can write it basically in terms of the wavelength that I am trying to find what the wavelength is, lambda is going to be the C divided by F or C times C because remember the period is just the inverse of F. A lot of textbooks and actually including ours too uses the the letter T for period. But because I'm going to use the letter T shortly, I don't want to confuse the two T's. The second T I'm going to use is referring to the temperature T because it's extensively used there. So I, I don't want to use the same letter T. So sometimes I'm going to use the letter P for period in here. So period is the time it takes for a whole oscillation. So if I'm on that frog, for example, if a disturbance on the water comes, comes to it and hits it, the frog go up and down. The whole time it takes for it to go up and down is a, is a period. The distance between each two consecutive fronts or two consecutive uh, crests is what we call lambda. So this distance and this distance is lambda. The frog usually is a few centimeters wide. I mean, probably what? Five centimeters, six centimeters wide? Two inches, three inches maybe? The distance between this point and point, you can take the distance of the frog and divide it by like three or four, and you will find it's about a few centimeters. So this disturbance in here, the wavelength for it, I can from this picture to be, let's say, one centimeter, okay? So that is the value. If I know the speed with which the wave travels, basically from the minute the frog basically moves and watch the wave as it reaches the edge and time that, that gives me the speed with which the wave travels, if I can measure this distance from where the frog is all the way to the edge. Then I can find what the frequency is of this oscillation, how often the frog is going up and down, basically, what the frequency is. Like that's measuring using this law. Since I can find the speed with which the disturbance travels from the frog to the edge of the uh, water, 
And since I can estimate the wavelength of that disturbance on the surface of water, technically using this dispersion law, I can find the time it takes for the frog to go up and down, namely period, or how many times it goes up and down in one second, that is the picture. So this is basically all the high math that we're gonna be dealing with. Having said that, for light that we see it, we have, uh, it ranges between these two frequencies. The frequency is measured in Hertz, in honor of Mr. Hertz, who did a lot of work in uh, uh, radio communications, just after, uh, actually he was uh, working, at least I think he was a student of, uh, of uh, Maxwell. So what I want you guys to do is using this law, if you go back to it, C equals to lambda S. Does everybody see this one? You can take note of it if you want to, because we're gonna need it shortly, okay? C which is the speed of light. The speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. Okay. And F in here is given by, for the red light, that is the least frequency that we can see. I mean, the, uh, yes, the least frequency we can see with our own eyes is 4.5 times 10 to the power 14 hertz. That's the unit for it, okay? My question is, what is lambda for red light? The highest frequency we can see is for violet, which is about seven times 10 to the power 14 hertz. Using the same speed for light, I want to find what the wavelength for the violet is. You guys ready? Okay, you can start working on it right now. I'm gonna take my notes in here, and I guess this recorder in here works only on one, uh, one object at a time. So I'm gonna stop it. I'm gonna share again, so that I'm sharing the screen in here, okay? Share that instead. And let me take my notes in here. Okay. So the frequency for red light, was 4.5 times 10 to the power 14, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, the violet, I said is, this is the least light we can see with our own eyes. This is the most, the highest light we can see with our own eyes. It's seven times 10 to the power 14 hertz, correct? I'm taking the speed of light C to be 300,000 kilometers or C times 10 to the power eight meter per second. My question is, what is lambda for red and what is lambda for, uh, for, uh, for violet? Remember, C is equal to lambda times F. Calculators, and I need some numbers. Mm -hmm. Are you guys seeing this screen now? I changed from the PowerPoint. If you're still looking at the PowerPoint, please let me know. Okay. Did it change for you guys? Yeah. Okay, very good. I keep talking, but my mic's not on. Did anybody find the value for lambda for the red? Calculator. I think we need to. Okay. Mm. Mm. Okay. 
Again, it's yeah, not there is it's not nothing wrong or uh, right. Okay, everything is correct. Okay, whatever you find is fine. But I need an answer. Anybody? Anybody? Ugh. I don't have a calculator, so I can't do it. Sorry, sir. <laughs> Are we finding red right now? I'm sorry. Yeah, we're trying to find lambda for red right now. Oh. Um. Well, I have it in my calculator right now. Do you want like the actual numerical value or the what? Uh, the that's value? what's. Uh, yeah, what's the number for lambda? Oh uh, well, let me just count out the. Placements then. Okay, please. Who's this? Is this Haley or who's talking right now? It's Haley. Okay. <laughs> I need somebody else also to do the uh, violet, okay? I don't know how to say that number, and I feel really stupid. <laughs> you don't have to say that. Okay, let me help you guys, okay? Everybody wants to see the answer? Okay, so this is my cheat sheet, okay? I'm using, uh, okay, again, I have to stop sharing in here, and then I have to go back into, uh, what is that, uh, share again? And since I closed Microsoft. Okay, do you guys see the screen now? Yes. Okay, so. What I have in here is C equals to lambda F, and I want to find lambda. Lambda is going to be C over F. Do you guys see that? And C is three times 10 to the power eight. I have to use the uh, meter per second if I'm using this divided by. For, for the red light, 4.5 times 10 to the power 14, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, let me see if I can, uh, yes. Okay, so if I do that, this is what the calculator is telling me. 667, or 6.67 times 10 to the negative seven, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm gonna divide it by uh, 10 to the power negative nine because I like to express, when it comes to frequencies, it's a good idea to express it. Oops, uh, let me go down in here. To the power uh, negative seven negative nine, okay, to the power of negative nine, okay. Uh, it's a common practice to express this number in terms of, uh, of uh, nanometers. So the answer is, okay, 667 nanometers. Okay, so let me go back into the other one, share, where is my screen? So this answer in here is 667 nm. So that's the, the, the longest wavelength that we can see. It's actually a little more than that. It's about 700 nanometer because I took a number that is kind of uh, 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 low in terms of, uh, I mean high in terms of frequency. We can see uh, actually a little less than that, okay? This is red. And we can see dark red, if you wish, uh, it tilts it toward the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the dark side of the light, okay? So the uh, ultra or infrared. Okay, the next one for violet, I'm gonna leave it to you guys and you're gonna submit it to me, included with the red light as part of our participation uh, work today. Do you guys understand that? Yes? 
Yes. So you guys are going to do the calculation on your yeah. own. Forget to divide your number at the end or multiply it by a billion. If you multiply it by a billion, you're going to get a number that is 200, okay? You get 400 or 500 uh, nanometers. The unit is going to be in nanometers. So that's basically a typical number that we use for our, uh, for our, uh, for our uh, <laughs> wavelength, okay? So the wavelength for uh, light, we usually use the, uh, what is my screen here? Where is the PowerPoint? Yeah, here it is. Do you guys see the PowerPoint now? Yes. Okay, very good. So I'm going to ask you guys to submit that as part of your participation. Uh, um, Do you have that PowerPoint up on Canvas? Yeah, I'm going to post. I think I have the PowerPoint, but it's missing a few slides. So it's missing this slide, actually, in there. So I'm going to uh, yeah, uh, post, uh, post that one again. OK, what I want you guys to do also is uh, for those who are not with us, and I think there are quite a few who are not with us today, for those who are not with us, also you're required to submit this time. I'm going to accept it no later than this Thursday, okay? Everybody. So I'm going to ex uh, extend it to Thursday. So by then, everybody would have this and his or her grade for participation. Does this sound like a good plan for everybody? Yes. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, that, so that's basically some of the properties of light. Light is really nothing but a wave, just like a disturbance created on the surface of water. And the characteristics of waves are, uh, are uh, the fact that they, uh, they uh, travel, and they travel with a certain frequency and a wavelength. The speed for light is a special number, it's 10 to the power uh, 8 meters per second. One of the disturbing facts that scientists faced toward the end of the century, of the 19th century, that is, in the late 1800s, was uh, the trouble that on the surface of water, the wave travels on the water itself. On the rope, the, water travel, uh, the, uh, the wave travels on the rope itself. So one of the fundamental properties of waves is that they acquire a medium to travel in. So that was a problem because Maxwell's equations did not have a medium or they didn't tell us what medium the uh, electromagnetic waves travel in. So people were disturbed by that fact and they introduced the concept of ether. They said that there is a medium where everything is happening in, including uh, it's like a, a stage where every, uh, all the action is happening where we must have that medium for light to travel in. Just like the water, for example, is required for the surface water or even for the, the, uh, the deep water, or uh, for, for example, for the earthquakes they require, which are kind of waves also, they require the earth itself for it to, to travel. Or for example, the service on a string or a rope, they require the rope itself, or the sling, slinky, if you guys are familiar with that, that is also, also a, a wave. Do you guys know any other big way that we live with on a daily basis and without it, we would not function properly? Can anybody tell me? Example of a wave that sound we wave. use. I'm sorry? A sound wave? Sound wave, very good. I mean, wave, uh, sound itself is a wave and requires actually the air or the medium, doesn't matter. I mean, even the travels in solids and water and everything else. So that is actually a wave. That is something that without it, we will not be able to, to, to function. If you try to talk in vacuum, for example, if two astronauts are up in the air, for example, they're in interstellar space or inter, uh, they're uh, uh, outside of their station, and if they do not have microphones, you can scream your head off, the person next to you will not be able to hear you because of the fact that there is no way for sound to travel without a medium. So that was really the disturbing fact that people faced. So they made the hypothesis of the, of the, of, uh, the uh, ether. Another thing that was really troubling at that time was the fact that, look, sound travels at best, at least in the air, was 343 meters per second. 343 versus 300 million is a very tiny speed. You <laughs> can see the difference between sound and light. Light travels 300 million meters per second versus sound, which is travels 343 in the air, 
or even in the ocean, which is about 1,500 meters per second, it's still a tiny number compared to the uh, to the uh, to uh, the speed with which the uh, 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 the light travels. So the ether has to be super 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 thick medium, not just a medium out there, but it has to be extremely dense medium because of that difference in the speed rate. So people were disturbed by it. Michelson and Morley actually tried to find where the ether is, trying to find the speed of the Earth with respect to the ether, and they didn't find it. It took Albert Einstein later on to come up with different uh, theory to explain and actually say, forget about the ether, light, Maxwell's equations, they do not require medium, so light travels in vacuum. Thank God they do, because uh, our night skies will be completely dark without that, because we will not be able to see the stars, because the light requires a medium, if it requires medium, we will not be able to see them. As a matter of fact, we will not be able to see the sun at all, because the distance between us and the sun is actually a vacuum also. So if light does not travel in vacuum, our days and nights will be the same thing, completely darkness, nothing in them. So in a sense, it's a blessing the fact that the sun, or at least light, or the electromagnetic waves do not require a medium. So they travel in vacuum, and that is one of the things that, you're, you're, that, that is kind of a, 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 if you wish, a, a different for waves versus any other wave that we know of. Wherever you are right now, you are inside your room, you are inside your, your office, you are inside probably somewhere else trying to follow this class. And if you look around you, you're actually submerged from everywhere in electromagnetic radiation. Think of every single point in space around you right now, and it is an unbelievable amount of electrical fields and magnetic fields. And they go in every which way. Some of them are for your own phone. The phone is actually requires electromagnetic waves for communication. Uh, some of them are coming from your TV signal, from all the electronics in your house. Some of them are actually from you it's yourself because of the fact that you have atoms in your body. And some of them are coming from outer space, from different stars, different planets, different objects emitting radiation every which way. So, and this is because light does not require medium and they travel everywhere and the space you're around you is really full of them. I don't know how you can visualize an electromagnetic uh, light, electric field that is around your, you right now. If you point your finger anywhere in space right now, in that specific point, there is a bunch of electric fields pointing every which way. And the only reason why we are not electrocuted is because on average, they average to nothing. They average to zero because they're pointing everywhere, okay? So that's basically why we are not feeling them. So light, this is a star. Are you guys following me on PowerPoint right now? Because I want to make sure that we're on the same page. Yes. yes? Okay, very good. Uh, so basically light, as it leaves an object, doesn't matter what that object is, it's going to travel in, in, in a bubble, if you wish, on a sphere. And that sphere of an ever-increasing radius so if you, if you think about it, for example, uh, if this, the, the, the star right now has a spherical shape. It's like, like the sphere itself. Every single point on that sphere emits light. So light in here, when it, it leaves, is going to travel. And if I take a cone in here of a certain size, let's say, for example, a meter square, okay? And that meter square is going to spread uh, in space as the light is emitting back. And because the area of the sphere actually is proportional to the square of the radius, the intensity of the radiation drops as one over distance squared. So this is one of the properties. If you go, for example, if you have a candle in your house or a light bulb, it doesn't matter, a light source, it doesn't matter what that light source is. If you're close from it, you will see the light super bright. If you start to move away, it, the, the, it, it looks dimmer. And if you further move uh, further and further, you're going to see that light start to diminish to a point that it becomes a point in space, and then after that, it's going to sink completely out of, the, out, of the, out of view. And this is because 
the light itself source, whatever that light bulb that you have, is still emitting the same radiation. It's not emitting more or less. So it's still emitting the same thing. It's the fact that you are moving away from it. That intensity is spreading toward a bigger and ever increasing uh, uh, area, and the intensity drops for you, wherever you are moving away from it, appropriately. And the appropriate law is one over distance squared. So as you move away, and this is basically part of the properties of space, actually. It's not related to anything else. Light, as far as the light source, as far as the star or a light bulb, it doesn't matter. It's emitting at a single point. And that point is uh, because it's spreading in space, the radiation, radiation as it moves away, is going to diminish by one over square, uh, square, the distance square. It is an example for you guys, and we're going to work out this example together. Okay? This is again, you're going to be required to submit at least once we do that. Okay? Are you ready for it? Yes? No. Yeah. Did somebody say no? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, uh, who's that? Okay. No one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, seriously, oops, let me go back in here. So we have a light bulb. This is because it's very important when we're talking about uh, stars. And I just gave an example earlier of Proxima Centauri and why it's so faint in here, although it's a nearest star. And it's because it doesn't emit that much light, for example. And as we move away, uh, we see as uh, we move away from it, so the light intensity starts to diminish. Yeah. And uh, the video recordings I posted on YouTube, and I hopefully most of you now would, uh, would go and see them. Uh, I, we looked at the stars, and I mentioned in those videos that Ceres is the brightest star. And its luminosity actually is the highest value, and it's a negative number uh, than anybody else. Although, uh, pro, uh, I mean, Ceres is about uh, 8.6 light years away from us, it appears brighter than, for example, the Proxima. Proxima actually doesn't appear at all to the naked eye. And that is because it's a super bright object. But as the object starts to, as we move away from the object, its luminosity diminishes, or at least its brightness diminishes. Luminosity stays the same. So here is an example. This is actually from the textbook. This is from your book, okay? I have a 120 uh, watt light bulb. This is the one that you can go to Walmart right now and grab. I don't know today if it's a good idea or not, but at least in normal times, you can go and get a 120 uh, watt light bulb. And let's say, for example, I measure its intensity and find it that it's 2.4 watts. The W here is the watt per meter squared. Okay. This is a two meters away from it, about six feet. This is what we're recommended to stay away from. So basically somebody is holding a light bulb and you decided not to, uh, you decided to uh, practice, what is that called again? Uh, social distancing? Social distancing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we are at six feet away from it, two meters away from it. And this is how much we measure, 2.4 watts per meter square. My question is, how much is it going to be when we move away four meters apart to it. When we move even six more feet to the already existing six, uh, it's gonna be uh, four meters. What do you guys think? Is it gonna be more or less? It's gonna be less. less. Does everybody agree that it's gonna be less? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yes. okay, very good. How much less? Is it gonna be less by a factor of half or a factor of divided by four or divided by what? Remember, let me go back to the previous slide. That's going to give me a hint. Intensity drop by one over distance squared. Jesus Christ. And we were at two meters. I'm sorry? What? <laughs> so the, the intensity drops by one over distance squared, correct? Yes. So the distance was two meters, and we moved to two, uh, four meters. Did we double or uh, did we quadruple or triple the distance from two meters to four meters? Double. 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 So the intensity dropped by? Half. Double? Uh, by a factor of two or by a factor of four. Look at it. 
It's one over distance squared. So factor of four. Factor of four, because one over double squared is divided by four, okay? So the intensity, let me go back to the other slide so that we can understand the idea here, because it's important when you're studying uh, uh, astronomy in here to understand this concept. Let me go into uh, my handy dandy tool in here. Okay. So the intensity was 2.4. It doesn't matter what the units are. Let's call them, so they are watts per second per meter squared. At a distance of two meters, correct? My question is for meter, how much is going to be? Well, we doubled this. So this one has to drop by a factor of one over double squared, okay? Has to drop by a factor of one over four actually. So it's gonna be 2.4 divided by four. And what is 2.4 divided by four? Is this correct? 0.6, yeah. 0.6 meters squared, okay? So as you move away, it appears four times less bright than when you were at two meters. Do you guys understand that? Yes? Yes. Okay, so let's move to 10 meters now. So when we are 10 meters from it, we go from two meter to 10 meter. How much did we uh, go by from two meter to 10 meters? We got, we went a factor of? Five. Five. Factor of five, correct? Five times, okay? So the intensity drops one over five, because it's one over distance squared, yes? Yes. Yeah. So five squared is uh, 25 and 2.4 divided by 25 is very close from 0 0.1. What is it, 0 0.01? 0 .1. 0 .1. Okay, two divided by 25, yeah, I think. Am I right or am I wrong in here? Because I'm doing just this in my head. Okay, let me get it first. 2.4 divided by 25. I'm getting point zero. Yeah, zero point one. Yeah, or zero one, zero one. I'm sorry, zero one. Yeah, tenth. Okay. Yeah, from two to twenty is a tenth. So it's a zero point one watts per meter square. So you see how the intensity drops in the year? It becomes super dim at ten meters away from it. Now oh, the last question in here is what happened when you move? You violate the law. You actually go to one meter. Go to one meter. <laughs> Okay, we're not doing social distancing now. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting closer now, okay? <laughs> so, did we go up or down in distance from two meters to one meter? Down. Down. By a factor of half, okay? Yes? Yes. Yeah. So this number in here, the 2.4 will increase by a factor of two squared. So instead of 2.4, it's going to be four times as much. Okay, and four times as much is going to be, what is it, four times 2.4 is almost 10. 9.6. Yeah, 9.6, almost 10. About 10 watts per meter squared. As you get very, very close from it, it becomes super bright, okay? So that's how this works. Again, it doesn't work proportional to the distance, but rather it's, it's proportional to the uh, square of the distance, okay? Inversely proportional to the square of the distance, I should say. How are we doing on time? Still have a few more minutes? Okay, good. Okay. So this is an important concept that you guys really need to uh, work with. And I'm going to include this slide in here. And of course, my notes too, the ones that I did the calculation with, so that you guys have an idea of how this thing works, okay? Yes? Okay. So this is basically so far in terms of the properties of light, in terms of its intensity, in terms of its, uh, its, uh, its spectrum, basically, light comes into, let me go into the, do you guys see the PowerPoint slide? Yes. Okay. 
So light comes in through different frequencies, basically. This is we call light the visible light, really. This is what our eyes are sensitive to. This is basically all what our evolution uh, did on Earth. Basically, on Earth, we evolved in such a way that our eyes became sensitive to this part of the spectrum. You guys see where the light starts? This is where the red is. I don't know if you can you see the visible in here, where it says visible. Mm -hmm. That's so this is basically how our, our life evolved. There are some, uh, uh, there are hair, what looks like hairlets actually inside the uh, retina, inside the eye. And they are, uh, they are, uh, the, the, the electrons in those uh, hair-like uh, structures, they're extremely sensitive to these frequencies, the one that you calculated for the red light and the one that you're gonna calculate for the violet light and anywhere, anywhere in between so that the, the electrons will move up and down and that creates a signal an electrical signal that travels through your, uh, your, your optical nerve all the way to the brain, and the brain interprets that as being different colors. For those who, I mean, the, the, the mechanism is so complicated in the outside of physics, basically in astronomy, that people, until now, it's a big topic in terms of actually research in that area. But the point being in here that some people have different uh, perception of even the colors, what looks like red to you, and you can swear is red to you probably is a different shade of red as far as I'm concerned and some other people have a different shades of it and so on and so forth. So that is outside of uh, uh, something that we don't understand. Actually, as a matter of fact, there are people who are color blind, blind and they can distinguish between the different spectra. Mm -hmm. That is what the visible light is. That's what we normally call light. The spectrum that you can see here actually called electromagnetic wave. From the extremely high energetic radiation, that is of a very, very, very short wavelength, extreme high energies of the less than 0 0.01 nanometers. This is of the size of the nucleus of the atom, so small, okay? To the size of the X-ray, X-ray radiation is uh, between 0 0.01 to about 20 nanometers, and that is basically where uh, the spectrum is. Actually, let me go into the next slide in here, give this better visual. Gamma rays are uh, less than 0 0.0. You see where the NM stands in here in this slide? It stands for nanometers, basically. For uh, radiation that is of that order of magnitude, this is uh, uh, gamma rays. They're extremely high energy processes. They uh, occur in the nucleus. They occur also in some of the uh, uh, emissions that occur in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in some of the, like uh, 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 in the universe. These are very, very, very deadly uh, energies. And uh, you don't want to be near them when they happen, okay? And for the most part, they are, uh, occur at uh, either very, very low intensity or uh, very short bursts of them that uh, don't last too long. Otherwise, if they last too long, they can decimate any kind of life form, actually any kind of matter, don't, not to stand in front of them. The temperatures involved for that, they are about 100 million Kelvin. Processes like this happen inside the uh, core of the star or something like that. They are very high energy processes. X-rays also, they require extreme high temperatures from uh, about a million to about 100 million uh, Kelvin. This is in gas, uh, in clusters of galaxies, supernova and solar corona. Did any one of you go to any kind of a hospital and had his or her x-ray done? <laughs> yeah. Did you guys see what the technician does before he pushes the button? It's behind the wall. <laughs> he hides, yes. And he leaves you exposed. <laughs> that is not nice, is it? <laughs> because of the high energy of this thing, too. I mean, uh, he's also around it more often, too. So. Well, I mean, uh, since he's going to make you exposed to it. Why do you <laughs> anyway, the point being in here is they're used actually on a very, very short uh, period of time. They don't really last that long. So that you're, you're to some extent uh, not going to be exposed too long for it, and it's actually needed for it to uh, to reach the uh, the inner structure that he or she is looking for, usually for bones and things like that. Okay, so to map that to you. 
So this is basically the next highest energy uh, radiation. You don't want to be exposed too long for them. They are going to change your, 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 your not the molecule, they're gonna change actually your nucleus of your atom and uh, make alterations of it that's going to basically destroy the, the, the entire matter that is in front of them. Gamma rays will do that for sure. X-rays will go into the nucleus also and start messing around with the atom and things like that. And we will talk about this toward the end of the chapter. We'll talk about the, how is this related into the atom. Ultraviolet radiation also uh, are very, very energetic. And their wavelengths are between 20 to about 400 nanometers. Uh, UV radiation, and you guys probably uh, are familiar with that when you go to uh, the ocean near the beach, you will see that you need some protection from those because uh, overexposure to uh, UV radiation also can cause a lot of damages, including cancer and all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. They're also, uh, they occur in supernova phenomenon. This is the remnants of supernova and very hot stars, extremely hot stars. Okay? Our good thing is about our star is its temperature is way below, which is good. Otherwise, we would have, we would receive a lot of radiation from, from it and uh, life would not exist. So this is one of the things uh, about, uh, about stars. If uh, you're looking at the star, usually there is a comfortable zone next to it where uh, the radiation, where at least uh, water can exist in liquid form. But if the star emits a lot of UV radiation, then uh, there is no way, even if you are in that zone, it's gonna be very hard unless you are living into a some sort of a certain environment, like for example, what's going on in one of the moons of uh, Jupiter, it's not gonna be safe for life. The visible radiation is between 400 and 700 nanometers. So your number for the, uh, for the violet uh, frequency should be around this number, okay? For the frequency that I give you guys. So it should be around 400 nanometers. If you find anything very far off, like 40, or 7,000 nanometers, that means you went wrong. That means something went wrong in the calculation. So please check your number again before you submit it. Uh, the temperature is anywhere between 1,000 to 10,000 Kelvin. Our temperature, uh, our sun's temperature, surface temperature is about 5,500 Kelvin. So this is, puts us exactly in this zone. So this is usually most of the stars, that is the stars of our, uh, most of the stars, they must be more than a thousand for sure Kelvin, otherwise it's not a star. But uh, some stars actually are a lot, a lot more, uh, have higher temperatures and they can do that. But for our sun and the size of the stars that are average size like our sun, their temperature is in within this range, okay? And that's why our sun produces a lot of visible light. That's why apparently we evolved also to be sensitive to those visible lights. So, the range for the visible light is between that range of 400 to 700 nanometers. Then comes the infrared. The infrared is anywhere between a thousand nanometers to a million nanometers. At this point, it doesn't make sense to talk in terms of nanometers, but talk in terms of micrometers or millimeters. So anywhere between a micrometer and a millimeter is the infrared. And this is in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, astronomy, in terms of uh, cool clouds, gas, planets, and moons, and, things, and animals also. We are between that range in terms of temperature. We live in an environment where our room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. Remember, it's about 23 degrees Celsius or something, but the temperature in here I used is about uh, 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 in Kelvin, which you act with 273 uh, degrees. So it becomes about 300 Kelvin. This is our temperature. So this is our daily experience. And that's why, and we will understand that toward the end of this chapter, how uh, goggles basically work in terms of uh, that they are used by the military to, to look at uh, people and uh, their enemies or uh, to go hunting and things like that. Animals emit radiation, just like anything else, because of they have a given temperature, especially at night when it's cold in the surroundings and an animal is moving around with a given temperature around 300 Kelvin in his body, this is the warm-blooded animals, of course, uh, then you can see them. You can see them with the proper tools that they take infrared radiation. Okay. Do you guys know what I'm talking about, those goggles used by the military and uh, some of the... Uh, yes, no? Maybe? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So that's the technology used for that, okay? 
Then comes the microwave. Microwave region is now you're talking about longer and longer wavelengths. That means in this case, the frequencies actually is a lot less than what it was in here. Oh, High three. Oh. I'm sorry? No, my bad. Okay, so a high frequency means short wavelength and the low frequency means long wavelength. So now we're talking about a millimeter to about a meter, okay? And the temperatures are usually very, very cold, okay, temperature. You know, this is, if we're talking about the, uh, the, the universe, the rest of the universe, we're talking about the background radiation, which is uh, about two point something Kelvin, which is very, very uh, small, as far, at least as far as the, uh, universe is concerned. And then you have other active galaxies, but they're very far away that they wavelengths actually initially they were very, very, very short wavelengths, but they get stretched by some, we're going to learn about it in this chapter called the, the Doppler effect. So they appear to be in the microwave region because of the extreme speeds with which the stars actually are moving or the galaxies are uh, receding so much. So that's basically uh, another uh, phenomenon that makes this wavelength appear longer than what they are, actually. And that's a phenomenon that we will discuss toward the end of the chapter. And then comes the most important terms of our daily experience, and those are, of course, the radio waves. Radio waves is what we use for our, uh, I mean, uh, for our remote controls, probably we use the infrared, but for most of our uh, signals that we send back and forth over long distances, we require radio waves. Radio waves are actually good for trans telecommunications. And actually, are actually also some of the waves that are coming from different objects in the uh, universe are so much stressed that they are actually, their wavelengths are greater than one meter, okay? Right now, it's 312 according to my watch. I don't know how much it is right now. I'd like to stop here so that next time when we uh, pick it up, we're gonna pick it up from this one. I'm gonna give you a few more minutes. Hopefully you guys are going to work through the problem that I gave you. And also, if you have any questions for me right now overall, especially in terms of testing and things like that, and uh, in terms of a project or anything like this, yes? Let me uh, stop the sharing. Right now. And you can turn on your videos if you guys have them so that they can see who's asking them. Andrea still here with us? Yeah, she's here. Are we going to meet here every Tuesday and Thursday or? Yes, every Tuesday and Thursday we're going to have our, our virtual class. I'm going to be posting the recording on, on Canvas. I'm going to also uh, be uh, basically putting assignments in there. I also would want to have you guys really ask questions on Canvas. Let me go back onto Canvas. Canvas. Yeah. I want to, again, go back into uh, discussion groups in here that I'm creating. My internet is slow now or something because it's taking, should not be slow because we're talking and then that's probably the, can the canvas itself. And uh, yes, uh, here is the uh, chapter five. So if you have any questions, Please ask them in here. I'm going to create an assignment actually for you guys. To, uh, Can you upload uh, those uh, extra slides? Yeah, uh, I'm going to upload the entire, uh, re-upload everything, including my notes actually that I took today, including the other uh, the other part that I have in, in there. So let me create a place for you guys where you're going to uh, uh, upload your stuff in your assignment and uh, it's going to be called chapter five. Uh, uh, participation. And it's due by Thursday, which is the 26th. And I'm gonna allow it until the evening because some people probably are for some reason or the other and may not have access to this. Uh, because of the fact that uh, so I'm going to put it at 11 p.m. by then. Hopefully, everybody would have done their work. And it's worth one point because it's participation. And I'm going to go into more options so that you guys are allowed to submit. Actually, 
online, okay? And it's gonna be a file upload so that you can upload your files, scanning them or taking pictures of them. And this is for exercises related to lecture. Does this sound like it's a good plan for everybody? Yeah. Okay, so please uh, follow up with this. Make sure you do your uh, the, the problems you do in there. And also, I want you to make sure that you guys are safe and uh, staying at home and following all the recommendations that the KLS we do. Stay at least, what is it, uh, six feet from one another, from uh, uh, anybody. And if you know anybody who uh, needs help, please help them or direct them where they need to go. Okay? Okay. okay. I expect to hear from you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. okay bye. <laughs>